Yeah, it's great. I got a little statue here this morning. Don't go to sleep. He's watching. Yeah. I'll tell you about him in just a moment. But, um, you know, in our world, one of the greatest challenges of life is figuring out who you are. Figuring out our identity. Who are we supposed to be? You know, a lot of times we focus on what we're supposed to do, but identity is about who we're supposed to be. And figuring that out is a challenge for a lot of people. How we see ourselves affects everything in life, including our connection to God. How, how we see ourselves impacts our ability to relate to God. Not his ability to relate to us, but our ability to relate to him. And that's why figuring out our identity is so important. It starts early in life trying to figure out who we are. And uh, a lot of times, uh, hopefully, people figure it out uh, during their school age years. Uh, but sometimes it takes longer for some folks. And sometimes it's not until adulthood or do they really kind of figure out, who, who am I? Who am I? You know, and here in our neck of the woods, kids are getting ready to go back to school. And a lot of things they'll do at school are things that will shape or help them determine their identity. Not just what they do, but, but who they are and who they become. So how do, we, how do we do this? How do we find our identity in a world uh, that has all kinds of suggestions for what our identity should be? And how do we do this when there's an enemy, Satan, who's constantly, constantly lying to us so that we never know what our real identity is? How do, how do we find out who we are supposed to be in the world. There was a guy named Blaise Pascal. He was a, a French mathematician, a philosopher, who said the only way you're ever going to know yourself is by knowing God through Jesus Christ. That was a scientist that said that. But look at what the Bible says. In Colossians 1.16, it says, all things were created by him, that being Christ. And he created everything in heaven and on earth. He created everything that can be seen and everything that can't be seen. Everything was created by him and for him. So what this verse is telling us is that we did not create ourselves. So guess what? If we did not create ourselves, we cannot tell ourselves who we're going to be. And that is a very opposite thinking from what's going on in the world today. When a hammer is created, the hammer doesn't look at itself and say, you know what, I'm going to be a screwdriver. When a dog is created, it doesn't go look in the mirror and say, today I'm going to meow like a cat. No, created things are told what they're going to be. They don't get to choose what they're going to be. And, and, I, and I get it. That's very, that's very different thinking from what's going on in the world today. It's very different from the American way of life because in the American way of life, we're told you can be and do whatever you want to do. But it leaves out the fact that we are created beings, and therefore the one that created us created us for a purpose. It created us for a reason. And it's only through knowing God, through Jesus Christ, can we ever really discover, who am I supposed to be? Because he's the one that created us. In the scriptures, the phrase, in Christ, in him, those two phrases, in Christ and in him, uh, they are used uh, a lot. I don't know, I think the video said like 170 some odd times. Uh, that those phrases are used. 136 of those times, it is the scriptures telling us who we are in Christ, who we are in him. 
the Bible spends a lot of time helping us define, discover, figure out, flesh out who we are in Christ. Because we can't tell ourselves who we are. So this morning, I want us, to, we don't have time to cover all 136 for those of you that were worried. We're not, we're not going to do all 136 of them. We're only going to look at four of them this morning. Only four. We don't, we don't have time to cover all of them. But I want us to look at four specific things throughout Scripture that tell us who we are in Christ so that we might know our identity. Because I, I, here's, here's the thing. As, as adults, listen, this is an adult world we live in, but it is a dangerous world for kids. And, and so how, how do we adult in a dangerous world that's for kids? And, and, the, and part of the answer for that is that you and I know who we are in Christ. Because if we know who we are in Christ we can best help our kids figure out who they are in Christ. Not by telling them, but by showing them how they can discover that in their own relationship with Christ. And that's why this is so important. So who are you in Christ? The first one that I would like to point out is that in Christ, you discover you are wanted. You are wanted in Christ. Look at what Ephesians says. It says, God chose us to belong to Christ before the world was created. Think about that for just a moment. God chose you before the world was created. He wanted you. Before there was ever a planet spinning around the sun, God said he wanted you. You. Look at what he says. He chose us to be holy and without blame in his eyes. He loved us, so he decided long ago to adopt us as his children. He did it because of what Jesus Christ has done. It pleased God to do it. So God has chosen you over every plant, over every animal, over every majestic view this world could offer, both on this planet and gazing into the galaxies, there is nothing, nothing, nothing more important than you to God. He chose you before he created the world. Have you ever wondered why God created the world I mean, why set in motion this mess that we call life? Why did he do that? Because he chose you. And for you to exist, he had to create a planet for you to live on. Because he chose you. He loves you. He wants you. Every one of us. We are wanted. 1 Peter 2 9 says it this way You are a chosen people. You are a royal, you are royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, look at this you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people. Once you had no identity as a people. Now, you are God's people. Something amazing happens when we get into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We discover who we are. You see, it is possible to exist and not know your identity. That is possible. In fact, there's a lot of people doing it. Potentially some sitting in this room. Potentially some watching online. You exist, but you have no idea who you are. Because once... We were without an identity. But in him, we find who we are. The question becomes, though, does God stop wanting us? We get that we're special. We might, we might begin to grasp and understand that he loves us and that he wants us. But we know us, right? 
I mean, we know who we are. We, we know the person in the mirror in the, in the sense of we know what we've done. And we know what we're capable of doing. And will God really always want me? Look, look at what the Bible says in Romans 8. It says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, which there's a lot of those, aren't they? Nor our worries about tomorrow. Boy, there's a lot of that going on. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed, there's that phrase, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Gosh, this is amazing. God wants you because he knows that in him you and I discover who we are. Why will he never stop loving us? First of all, his love is not based on our performance. Amen, right? Isn't that great? God, God doesn't stop. God doesn't love me more when I'm good. God doesn't love me less when I'm bad. God just loves me. And I can't, I can't make it fluctuate. And so there's a lot of people that live out there thinking, oh, I've got to be better for God to love me. Baloney, God loves you all right, right now. Some people out there, they believe, oh, God doesn't love me because I messed up baloney. He loves you just as much as he's always loved you. So his love is not based upon our performance. That's, why we, that's one reason why we will always know that he wants us. Another reason is because his love for us does not change. God, God is not fickle. He is consistent. It does not change. Look at what 1 Corinthians 1.30 says. Because of what God has done, you belong to Christ Jesus. He, that being Jesus, makes us right with God. Listen, when you receive Christ as your Savior, Christ makes you right with God. And it was God who made it possible for you and I to know Christ. It's, it's cyclical. They feed off of each other, so to speak. And, and, and so, so God provided Christ, Christ in providing himself in you and I, placing our faith in him, our hope in him, then allows us to know God. Why is it so important that you and I know that we are wanted? Don't miss this. You want to know why it's so important that you and I know that we're wanted by God? Because if we don't know that, we will spend our life trying to find someone who wants us. And we will become what we think they want so that they'll want us. And that's not our identity. That's not how we discover who we are. And that's why we see so many kids get lost in today's world. They desperately want And so were you. And as adults in this world, as moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandparents, whatever relation it is that you have to children, it's, it, it becomes you and I discovering who we are in Christ only uh, provides them with an example of how they themselves can discover it. And figuring out who they are. If our kids don't know where their, where their identity comes from, let me tell you what's going to happen. Someone will steal their identity. And they'll never know who they were supposed to be. It's all discovered in Christ. And he wants us. He's always wanted us. Always. In Christ, the second thing I'd like to point out 
is that you discover you are valuable. Not only are we wanted in Christ, but we discover that we are valuable in Christ. What, again, the Bible says. In Isaiah 43, God says, you are precious in my eyes. I, I kind of chuckle at that because, see, I'm from the South, and the word precious is usually said with some type of cynicism in it. Aren't you precious? <laughs> see what I'm saying? And so, and so when I read that in the Bible, that, that's kind of the tape that plays in my mind, but that's not what the Bible means by that word at all. That word precious, it means highly valued, esteemed. Webster's Dictionary says it is something of great value, extreme worth, high priced. We all, listen to me, we all want to be precious in someone's eyes. I've got good news, you are. You are, you are precious in someone's eyes. In God's eyes, you always have been. You don't have to go looking for it. It already exists. Look at what Genesis tells us. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. His own image. So God and humanity share something that the rest of creation do not share. Nothing else in creation has the likeness or the image of God pressed on them like humanity. Humanity can reason. Humanity can think. Humanity can choose. Humanity doesn't have to be driven by natural desires. We we have a will that we can enact and make a choice. That's part of the image of God placed upon us. We live forever. We have a soul. We have a spirit that goes on in the image of God you and I have been created. That makes us pretty valuable. That makes us pretty esteemed. There's a value, I find it interesting that the scriptures say it here, there's a value in being male and female. They each bear the image of God. That's why gender is so important. Each gender bears the image of God. They are each valuable and esteemed. And in our culture, we find a devaluing of gender. We find a push to, to say gender is not that important. Listen, listen to me very carefully. What makes gender important, it's, it's, not, it's not the appearance of the gender. It is the likeness of God in that gender that makes it important. God created us to bear his image as men, as women. And it's precious. It's precious to him. We may devalue it, but we did not create ourselves. He created us. The Bible says that you and I, look at 1 Peter, it says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood. There's that word again. The precious blood of Christ. The sinless, spotless 
Lamb of God, the precious blood of Christ, priceless, highly valued, esteemed. God said, I'm going to use something precious, the blood of my only son, Jesus, to purchase and ransom something precious, those who bear my image. moms and dads, his aunts and uncles, his grandparents. We need to communicate this to the next generation. If we don't understand how precious we are in bearing the image of God, how can we possibly communicate that to the next? The Bible goes on to say, that in Christ, you have something to offer the world. See, not only are we wanted, not only are we valuable, we also have something to offer. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Can I tell you something? There may be accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. They are all formed under God's watchful care, and each one is a masterpiece. Now, again, in our society, there's a devaluing of life that is happening where we look at people and we say because of their behavior or because of their age or because of of, of their disability or, 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 or something, we look at them and we say they're not as important. They're not as special. That's such a lie. Each life is a masterpiece. That word, masterpiece, it means a perfect work of art. That's what it means. I uh, was given this little statue by a friend who went to China. When he came back, he brought me this gift. And he told me something that I've never forgotten when he gave me this. He said, this little Chinese soldier, that this is one of 10,000 in the world. I got it. It's one of 10,000. Now, I don't know if that makes it valuable, but I know it makes it unique. Here's the thing. You are the only you. You're it. And all of the humans who came before you and all of the humans who will come after you, you are the only you. You're a masterpiece. A perfect work of art. No one else will have the mixture of DNA and personality and choices and life experiences that you have. No one ever, ever. And that's why it's so important that you and I do what we were created to do, that we offer what we were created to offer, because no one else ever will be able to offer. In the way that you would offer it. Is that not amazing? Is that not just, does that not just help us understand just how important we are in knowing who we are? Is that no one else in the world can do what I do the way I do it in the time in which I do it? No one, no one. And no one can for you either. A successful parent 
helps their kids figure out what they were created to do. We each have a contribution that we bring to this planet that no one else can bring. And God brings us at the, he he introduces us on the stage at the right time in which no one else could do what he created you and I to do. The contribution that we have to offer. It says that, that we were created to do these good things that no one else can do. But we struggle with that, don't we? We struggle with the idea of doing the good that God has created us to do. I I think there's two reasons we struggle with it. Honestly, the first one is is that we're trying to be somebody else. I I think when we're trying to be someone, because we look at the world and we see other people in the world, we see people more talented or, or are, are better looking, or they make more money, or they have a skill I wished I had, or, or they're doing the life, they're living a life I wished I could live. And, and so instead of trying to be ourselves, we try to become them because we want to have what they have. And that really messes with our ability to do the good we were created to do. Because we're not being who we were created to be, we're trying to be someone else. That's one reason, but I, but I think another reason that, that we really struggle with doing the, God, the, the good that we were created to do is because we just don't feel very confident about it. We just, we're just not real sure that the good that I was created to do, that I'm going to be really good at doing it. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians. It says, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. Another way of saying that, he has made us competent to do the good he created us to do. A ceiling fan is wired to move air. But if it's not plugged into the source of power that makes it move, it just sits there. And yet that's what happens to you and I. If we're not, if we're not plugged into the right power source, we're created to do something. We're created for these good things that no one else in the world can do. But if we're not plugged into Christ, we just kind of sit here through life. We're part of the picture. We're part of the household. We're You know, we look nice hanging on the ceiling, but we're not doing what we were created to do. Our competence to do good, it comes from being plugged into Christ. And and when we we are walking with him, we know what we can do. Not not from ourselves, from our own strength, but because of, of what he can do through us. We had dinner a couple of weeks ago with some dear people here. Here, many of you know them. The, uh, they, they did. They used to do Jesus said ministries, at, and and they they don't do it anymore. The Hey Do's. If you don't know the Hey Do's, you need to have dinner with the Hey Do's. If you if you want if you want to feel good, go have dinner with the Hey Do's. And let them just tell you about how God used them in their life. And, and it's just amazing what, what they did. And how did they do You keep asking them, how did you do that? And, they, and the response is, I don't know, God just did it. Why? Because their competence was not coming from themselves. It was coming through their relationship with Christ. And you know what? There are people all the time who are asked to do things. And they say, oh, I can't do that. I can't, oh, I can't do that. I can't live in faith like that. I, oh, I can't go to that part of the world. Oh, I can't talk to that person about that. Oh, I can't serve in that way. Oh, I just can't do that. Let me tell you something. If you're relying on yourself, you're absolutely right. You can't do it. You can't do it. 
Because our confidence and our competence does not come from ourselves. It comes from being plugged into Christ. You see, for our kids to understand this, we must model it for them. Here's the thing that we're doing that was not, and I don't know that it's helping. We keep telling our kids that their competence is going to come from their education. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with having a good education. It has its proper place. But an education will not tell a kid what they were created to do. Only their creator can tell them that. But you see what, if, 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 if we are adults in this world and we're not operating that way and we don't understand that and we can't think that, we're just telling them the best thing we know to say, go get a good education. Boy, your life's going to stink without an education. I know a lot of people with an education who has a stinky life. Because an education can't tell you what you were created to do. God uses an education to help you do what you were created to do. Don't get them out of order. The fourth thing I'd like to point out is that in Christ, we are totally forgiven. Romans 8, 1 says it this way, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. That means no longer guilty. That's what that means. And here's what's amazing about it. There's no fine print. You've ever signed a contract to something, you get to the end of the contract, and there's all this little fine print, all this little stuff. It's like, why didn't they print that the same size they printed everything else? Because they don't really want you to read that. They don't want you to read the fine print. It's like when you watch a commercial, and the commercial's making all these grand statements about what their product can do. But, but if you notice above the bottom of the screen, there's all these little bitty words that just kind of flash up. That's the fine print. And I am so thankful that when we get to the end of the Bible, I mean, go there. If you have your Bible, go to the very, go to the very back page. Guess what? There's no fine print. There's nothing there that says, okay, but now if this is your case, or if you do it this way, or if that, it doesn't say that. It says, in Christ, there is no condemnation. There is no longer any guilt. And what keeps many people from figuring out who they are in Christ is the guilt of the things they did without Christ. And in Christ, there is no guilt. There is no guilt. That doesn't mean you're free to go do it again. No, you don't want to ever do it again. But you're you're set free from the guilt of what happened. And that's in Christ. Isaiah 43 says it this way, God says, I am the one who wipes out your lawless acts. I do it because of who I am. I will not remember your sins anymore. Wow. That's what happens in Christ. Ephesians 1, 7, it says it this way, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgave our sins. There is no longer any condemnation. As we think about our kids, as we think about ourselves in this world and figuring out who we are, the vast majority of us and the vast majority of the kids that we know are growing up in what we would call traditional homes or a traditional setting or at least with one parent. But as we go through this series, we're going to challenge you to think about a group of kids that maybe you don't normally think about. Kids who don't grow up with their parents. Kids who many times grow up in the system. We call them foster kids. 
And imagine a child growing up in a stable home with both parent or a parent or a loving home or a safe home, a secure home. And imagine the struggles those children have discovering their identity. Now then, go to a child who's being moved around. And imagine the struggle that must be going on within their hearts and in their minds as they try to figure out, who am I? Why am I here? If there is a God, why did he create me? Because those kids are pretty important too. And so through this series, out in the lobby each week, you're going to find Michelle and Amanda standing at a table for open hearts, open hands. We're going to collect care bags for foster families and foster children. If you'd like to be a part of that, you'll get all the information you need right there. But that'll be going on for the next couple of weeks while we go through this. Now, before we leave this morning, I got something I want to give you. I'm sorry, camera people, you're having to chase me around the stage because I left them over here. I have something I want to give you this morning before we leave. You remember how I told you in the Bible, there's 136 times we're told who we are in Christ? Somebody say, yes, pastor, I heard you say that. (laughs) That just makes me feel better, okay? Well, I've listed them for you. They're right here. Actually, I didn't do it. I found somebody online who did it, and it saved me a little time. I printed it for you. Actually, I didn't print it for you. Dana printed it for you. (laughs) Actually, all I'm doing is handing it out to you, okay? But I'm I'm going to let guys hand these out. Will you help Mark? Will you just take some of these and pass those out? Just give them to everyone. Roger, you mind helping out with that? Dan, will you help? Just pass those out. Those are for you to take home. I really encourage you to look through this piece of paper, to pull out your Bible and look up these verses and read them so that, first of all, you might know who you can be in Christ. If you haven't given your life to Christ, this is what awaits you if you give yourself to Christ. If you are a follower of Jesus, then I I pray that you will look at this and read this and discover who you already are. These are not things that are going to happen. These are things that have already happened in Christ. And then let's begin to behave as though that's who we are. Let's begin to think and act and do exactly that. I want to leave you with a prayer this morning as we get ready to leave. Notice this prayer. I hope you can use it. Maybe it will help you in your understanding. I don't think they got it. Did you guys get some? Oh, look, at there's all hands all up right there. Sorry, folks. It's not for you this morning. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> Thanks, guys. While they're, while they're continuing to hand those out, let's look at this prayer together. It says, Father... Teach me to know who I am or who I can be in Christ. Give me a hunger to know who I am in Christ and give me a willingness to satisfy that hunger by reading and accepting the truth of your word. Allow me to fall in love with the truth of your word, become your disciple, and let the truth set me free. Protect me from identity theft. Don't let the devil deceive me into believing the lies that God doesn't want me or that I'm not valuable or that I don't have anything to offer offer, or that I'm not forgiven. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you'd like to know more about what it means to be in Christ, the best way, seriously, pull out your smartphone, text the word CONNECT, to 330-400-2869. And that starts a line of communication. We'd love to be able to continue to share with you the truths of God's word.
Thank you for being here this morning. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. I'll see you in a few weeks.